We're very lucky today to have Abba Gupta to here to talk to us about genetics. Abba started here, got her undergraduate degree at Yale, then because really one Ivy League school isn't enough, got her MD and PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, came back here to train with Matt State and has stayed on. Abba is a developmental behavioral pediatrician, but she also does excellent research in the genetics of autism. Abba is also a good friend and one of the most honestly, scientifically enthusiastic people that I encounter at Yale. You have a conversation with Abba and you feel like it renews your faith in the scientific method and that we're going to figure these questions out. You feel like a first year graduate student all over again. So Abba, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. That was very generous. Um, so I'm happy here uh, to talk to you today about um, something that's really fascinated me for many years, the genetics of autism spectrum disorders. I want to start off with just some basic concepts um, in genetics before we delve into um, autism specifically. So <clears throat> the nuclear compartment in most of the cells of our body contain our genetic material. And this is packaged as 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set of the pair being inherited maternally and the other set being inherited paternally. And so the form of this genetic material is in chromosomes, which is a very simplified diagram of a chromosome. So you can see there's a central part, there are two arms, short arms and long arms. And so this uh, chromosome is made up of what you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard of the DNA double helix, the DNA ladder, and it does kind of look like a ladder. There's these sides, and then the rungs are made up of what are called nucleotides, these chemicals, bases, that pair up in a very specific way. And so stretches of DNA make up genes, which encode for proteins that make up our bodies. And it's the very specific um, sequence of these bases or nucleotides that is the genetic code, that uh, codes for the sequence of amino acids in the proteins that make up our body. All right. so. As I mentioned, DNA is housed in the nucleus of our cells. It undergoes a process called transcription, in which the genetic code is translated, or excuse me, transcribed into molecules called messenger RNA. This is exported out into the cytoplasm, where it hooks up with ribosomes, a protein-making machinery. And so again, that genetic code, um, the sequence of nucleotides, specifies the sequence of amino acids that make up this protein chain. All right, so when we try to discover, try to figure out what um, DNA mutations might cause a disorder, for example, autism, we look for uh, mutations. So one type of mutation um, consists of sequence changes. So again, here's a diagram of that DNA double helix, and the rungs are made up of those nucleotides, um, adenine, thymine pair up, guanine and cytosine pair up specifically. And then sometimes, maybe, who knows why, maybe it's spontaneous, maybe it's due to an environmental trigger, maybe some toxin, there might be a change. So for example, this rung, which is made up of an A and T base pair, changes into a C and G base pair. And so this could be completely benign. It might not affect the structure or function of a protein at all. Or it might be, uh, cause uh, differences between us, for example, in hair color or height or whatever. Um, or it could be very damaging. So it could affect the structure and function of a protein, maybe making it dysfunctional or even non-functional, and that could be very consequential because it could cause a disorder like autism. So here's some example of sequence mutations. This is, an exa this is a missense mutation where you, again, here have the sequence of nucleotides along the DNA ladder. And so groups of three of these nucleotides code for an amino acid. So in this example, you have groups of CAT, the initials for these nucleotides, and these code for an amino acid known as histidine. So again, let's say we have a spontaneous mutation or again, maybe induced or inherited um, that turns this uh, nucleotide, an A, into a C, and then the histidine becomes a proline. So now you have a different amino acid in the middle of that protein change. Again, it might have no effect or it could have a very damaging effect on the uh, structure and function of this protein. Here's an example of what we usually think of as very deleterious mutations, nonsense mutations, because there are some of these groups of three or triplets of uh, nucleotides that code for a stop signal, which tells the protein-making machinery that the, amino the protein is done and you can stop making that protein now. So here in this example, a CAG triplet 
codes for an amino acid known as glutamine. Let's say there's a mutation from acetyl T here, but this TAG actually codes for a stop codon. And if that occurs early on in the protein or in the middle of a protein, all of a sudden you have an abnormally short protein, and that could be very damaging. But sequence uh, variants are not the only type of changes we look for. Uh, we also look for what are known as copy number variants, or CNVs. So here's a simple diagram showing examples of this. Here is an example of a duplication. So you have a chromosome, and let's say this material in the orange and green is duplicated. So again, this might be benign, or it could be very damaging if you have genes in this area that all of a sudden you have an increased dose of, and that could be uh, deleterious. Here's an example of a deletion where you have a break um, on one arm of the chromosome, and this material gets deleted, and then even if the chromosome comes back together again, now you're missing maybe genes in that area that could be very important that are expressed in the brain. So let's turn now to autism specifically. And what's the evidence for a genetic basis? And there's several lines of evidence. So one um, come from family studies that look at sibling recurrence risk. So this is looking to see how often do siblings um, in families that already have a child with autism, how often do they also be, uh, are diagnosed with a, uh, autism spectrum disorder? So a study in 2011 showed that the risk is almost 20%, which is much higher than what you would find in the general population. But one could argue, well, you know, siblings grow up in the same environment. Maybe it's environmental. Maybe there's a shared environmental risk that's leading to autism. So genetics researchers try to get around that question by looking at uh, twins. So they look at monozygotic twins, I've abbreviated that as MZ, and dizygotic twins. So dizygotic twins share about 50% of their genetic information. They're like any brother-sister pair. But monozygotic twins are identical. So they share 100% of their uh, genetic information. So genetics research have looked to see, well, how often do MZ twins share a diagnosis compared to DZ twins? And it turns out that monozygotic twins do share a diagnosis more frequently than dizygotic twins. And that says that you know, they're growing up in the same environment, presumably, uh, so that there must be something genetic going on because they share a diagnosis more frequently. But what's important also to note, out, or note is that in these studies, MZ twins are not always concordant. So if you thought that autism was 100% genetic, Right? You would expect that identical twins would always share a diagnosis, and that's not the case. So there is something else going on, um, and any human geneticist in the field would say there are probably some unknown, unclear environmental triggers as well that we just don't know very well yet. Um, another line of evidence for a genetic basis is that there are about 10% of cases that also have a genetic syndrome that have been uh, uh, traced to very specific mutations and specific genes. So here are some examples of autism-related syndromes. So you've heard of probably some of these before, maybe the 15Q duplication, Angelman syndrome, 16P11, Fragile X syndrome, for example. We know that Fragile X is due to mutations in a gene called FMR1. If you look at the proportion of patients with Fragile X who have autism, who meet criteria for autism, it's a big proportion, about a quarter of males, 6% of females. But if you look at the reverse, so the proportion of patients who have been diagnosed with autism who have the syndrome, it's actually quite small, only 1% to 2%. So that tells you that even though there's a significant overlap between Fragile X and autism, it's a rare cause of autism. It doesn't explain any big proportion of cases. And, so, and it's also not necessary or sufficient. Another one, for example, is uh, tuberous sclerosis. We know tuberous sclerosis is due to mutations in the TSC1 and TSC2 genes. 20% of those patients meet criteria for autism, but tuberous sclerosis um, is only found in about 1% of patients with autism. So again, a rare cause of autism. But it's still important because it gives us clues, these kinds of overlaps, about what might be causing autism. So this is the bottom light slide, really, uh, bottom. Um, what I really want to get across to you guys is that autism spectrum disorders are complex with wide phenotypic variability, which you know very well. And there are multiple etiological factors, genetic and environmental. There's a great deal of genetic heterogeneity. And so really there is no one gene for autism, not even a few. The estimate is that there are likely hundreds of genes for autism, which is very much the case also with intellectual disability, where it seems that there are many genes that can lead to intellectual disability. So this slide um, is a bit outdated, uh, but I wanted to just show it to you to get across the point that 
there are multiple chromosomal regions across the genome that have been implicated in autism. So these are diagrams of the human chromosomes. And you can see the tick marks on the left point to areas, chromosomal regions that have been highlighted because of a linkage study or an association study or maybe uh, published uh, chromosomal abnormality or some interesting gene there that's been associated with autism. And as you can see, they're really all over the place. So it's really hard to get a handle on this. Like, how do you study so many different genes? How do you figure out what common pathway they might be affecting or pathways? So how do human geneticists go about trying to identify disease genes? So there's two main approaches. One is positional, the other is functional. In the positional approach, uh, geneticists look at the entire genome in an unbiased way. So they're not making any hypotheses about, well, I'm going to look at this region of the, uh, the genome or this particular gene. They just look genome-wide and just ask, where are the mutations in uh, individuals with autism? And then the functional method is hypothesis-driven. So for example, if you have some theory about what causes autism, let's say you're convinced it's the serotonin neurotransmitter system, then you'll hone in on just those genes, for example, that encode the serotonin receptors, the transporters, et cetera. And then so that's a very hypothesis-driven approach. Either way, the hope is that you'll find a list of candidate genes. And then really it takes more follow-up work to confirm that these really are disease genes. So for example, geneticists will do mutation screening of large cohorts. So let's say they have a family or two in which they find an interesting mutation in a brain express gene that seems it might be associated with the phenotype. They'll look in larger groups of patients and typically developing individuals to see are there more mutations that they can report on. Another very important thing to do is functional analysis. So you might have a long list of genes and mutations, but you have to really figure out, okay, these particular mutations, how do they affect the structure and function of a protein? Do they really cause damage? And that's really important to figure out because that's going to give you clues to the pathophysiology of the disorder. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the techniques that human geneticists use to try to find candidate genes. One is genome-wide linkage studies. So the, the bottom line here is that we want to identify loci or chromosomal regions that are inherited by affected individuals more frequently than you would expect by chance. So chromosomal regions, chunks of chromosomal um, regions are marked by DNA polymorphisms, such as SNPs. You might have heard of that term, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those are single bases that differ between people. And so what uh, linkage studies look for is how close, if the closer a marker, like a SNP, is to a disease gene, the more likely you're going to see co-segregation. In other words, the more likely you're going to see that SNP or SNPs traveling with the phenotype through pedigrees, through families. They're being inherited together because they're so close to get together. So if you pick up a, a paper on a linkage study, you'll see something called a LOD score, logarithm of the odd score. And so this represents the likelihood that a locus, a chromosomal region, is linked to the phenotype that you're studying. So a LOD score of three indicates that there's a thousand to one odds that the locus is linked to the phenotype. So in autism specifically, linkage peaks have been found on almost every chromosome. So I've distilled it down for you. I think there's at least 15 or more studies, genome-wide linkage studies in autism. And some of the highest lot scores are found in these uh, chromosomal regions. So a lot score of 4.81, which is quite impressive on the long arm of chromosome 3, another one on the long arm of chromosome 2, a couple of spots on chromosome 17. But the problem has been is that a lot of these studies don't confirm each other, they find different sets of linkage peaks. So how do you get a handle on that? One thing that human geneticists have tried to do is um, something called stratification of their subjects. So instead of taking all their subjects, they'll take a subset that are maybe more phenotypically homogeneous, thinking that maybe they'll find a common genetic mechanism. So a group um, a while ago now looked at 91 total families affected by autism, and they did a genome-wide linkage scan. So they had a number of these markers all throughout the genome and did this uh, statistical analysis and calculated a lot score, which is not quite impressive, um, about two on the long arm of chromosome 17. So in, in complex disorders such as autism, a lot score of three points, about 3.6 is considered significant. So this was not significant. But what they did next was interesting. So they took a subset of their families in which the affected child was always a male and then repeated the analysis um, and found that their lot score on the same region more than doubled. 
So this doesn't mean that they found a gene that explains all of autism. It means that maybe they found a gene that makes males vulnerable to autism. Maybe there's something there that makes males vulnerable to the phenotype. Another method is to look at endophenotypes or quantitative trait loci, QTL. So you know, even with gold standard diagnostic instruments, diagnosing autism is still very, can be very subjective. So one thing that uh, genetics researchers have tried to do is look at more quantitative traits. So this group looked at about 100 families, did a genome-wide linkage scan, found a you know, pretty un unimpressive LOD score on chromosome two, and then they took a subset, about half, and these, this subset, um, all the kids, the affected kids had free speech delay. They repeated the linkage scan and found that the LOD score more than doubled on that same region. So again, it's not um, saying that there's a gene here or genes that explains all of autism, but maybe it helps explain this particular endophenotype, which is free speech delay. Maybe it has something to do with language. So that's one way that human geneticists have tried to get a handle on these conflicting um, results from linkage studies. Another method um, is called GWAS studies or genome-wide association studies. So I talked about how in linkage studies, uh, there's a, you know, um, looking at pedigrees and families. In GWAS studies, you basically have two cohorts. You're a patients with autism and then another cohort of typically developing control individuals. And you're basically just asking the question, are there more mutations in one than the other? Where are those mutations? Etc. So a group, there were two big uh, studies published in 2009. One group did this genome-wide association study, had two big cohorts, again, of patients and typically uh, developing individuals, and uh, had a bunch of SNPs representing the entire genome, and just looked to see are there certain SNPs that are overrepresented in the patients compared to the control group. And actually, out of all of that analysis, they found one SNP on chromosome 5, the short arm of chromosome 5, actually didn't even land in a gene. It landed between two genes, cadherin 9 and cadherin 10. So when they do this analysis, they come up with something called a Manhattan plot, because it looks like the, the Manhattan skyline is punctuated by uh, uh, skyscrapers. And so uh, on the, on the uh, y-axis are the p-values, and then these are the chromosomes, 1 through x. And so they found the highest signal on chromosome 5. And here's a diagram of chromosome 5 right in here. And so the reason why this was interesting is because cadherin 9 and cadherin 10 are involved in neuronal cell adhesion, so involved in um, brain development. So this plausibly, right, could be as, uh, um, involved in, uh, in the uh, pathogenesis of, of autism. Um, but one of the themes of, I think, autism genetics research is that it can be quite low yield. So you do a lot of analysis, look at big cohorts, um, a lot of SNPs across the genome, and again, they landed on one that was statistically significant. Another group the same year published a report, another GWAS study, and they also looked at SNPs across the entire genome and found a different region happened to also be on the short arm of chromosome 5, but between, um, again, two genes rather than even landing on a gene called SEMA5A and a taste receptor. So maybe the taste receptor, not so important in autism, but the SEMA5A was very interesting because this, uh, the product of this gene, the protein has been implicated in axonal guidance. So again, uh, in neural development, which could be plausibly related to autism. But you do notice that they didn't replicate each other, and that's also the recurring theme in autism. I think I've already mentioned is that a lot of these studies come up with a different set of genes or locations that seem to be important. And I think, again, this just speaks to the genetic heterogeneity um, in the disorder. So here's another method that human geneticists use to find disease genes, um, cytogenetic analysis. So basically, this is looking for chromosomal abnormalities, so balanced versus unbalanced. Balanced chromosomal abnormalities are those um, in which there's no net gain or loss of uh, genetic material, but um, there's some abnormalities. So for example, in an inversion or a translocation, here's an example of a balanced translocation where you have two chromosomes, A and B, and for some reason, again, maybe spontaneous, inherited, they've switched ends here. So even if no chromosomal material has been lost or or gained, um, there's two breakpoints that have been left behind, and these breakpoints could go right through a very important brain expressed gene and completely disrupt that gene. So that's a balanced translocation. Here's an example of an unbalanced chromosomal abnormality, and everyone's pretty much familiar with this one, Down syndrome, trisomy 21, where you have a whole extra chromosome 21, so you have net gain of chromosomal material, and we know that there are a lot of clinical consequences to that. So here's a real life example that came through our laboratory here at Yale, where we had a patient with autism 
who had a chromosomal abnormality. So these are all the um, chromosomes laid out, organized. Um, and this is chromosome 7, and their error uh, points to the uh, uh, abnormal chromosomes. I mean, here's a blow up of that image where you have the normal 7, and then if you can see, there's a different staining pattern to that chromosome. And that's because there's an inversion that's happened. So this piece here and here broke, uh, there were breakpoints at these uh, sites, and then the chromosomal material in between flipped and reinserted. So now you have um, possibly disrupted genes left behind. So to figure that out, we did uh, use a technique called FISH, or fluorescence in situ hybridization. So what you're seeing here is a photograph that was taken under the microscope of this patient's chromosomes. They were dyed in blue. And so they've been laid out on a glass slide, put it under a microscope, take a photo. And we've also used um, DNA probes labeled in red that kind of stick to where we think that breakpoint is based on the karyotype. And so we see here, this is a normal chromosome 7. And the reason why you t see two signals is because this is a metaphase chromosome where part of the cell cycle where the chromosomes are condensed and um, there's sister chromatids. Um, and then you see the abnormal chromosome 7 here where that red signal that's supposed to span that breakpoint has split because of that inversion. And because we know now the sequence of the human genome, we can look exactly where that split happened and see is there any gene that's been disrupted there. And it happens that in this patient, a very important gene that um, uh, functions at the neural synapse has been split in half. And so our hypothesis is that this, is, uh, this uh, patient in this family is the only one who has a chromosomal abnormality of this type and also is the only one who has a diagnosis on the spectrum, so maybe those two are linked. So the next step would be to look at this gene in more families and see how big is the contribution of that gene. So this is how we go about identifying candidate genes and trying to confirm them as really being associated with autism. So there are also um, genome-wide CNV studies that have been done. So basically looking for copy number variants, duplications, deletions throughout the entire genome. A number of studies have been published on this. One group um, looked at a bunch of patients with autism and found that copy number variants were significantly enriched in certain pathways. So again, you see like a, a bunch of genes that have been affected by duplications or deletions. Um, often they're rare causes, so they might find one of these genes in one family, maybe a couple of families. Um, so what, they, what this group did was take a step back and say, okay, well, can we group these genes together in some kind of common pathway that would give us an idea about what, you know, maybe neurotransmitter systems or signaling pathways or some cell process are involved in autism. So they found that a bunch of their genes were all neuronal cell adhesion molecules. Another bunch were involved in the ubiquitin pathway, which is involved in protein recycling. <clears throat> Another group published a genome-wide CNV study and found that um, individuals with autism at a higher rate of rare genic CNVs. In other words, CNVs that land on genes, because sometimes you might find a CNV that doesn't land on a gene, it lands between two genes. But so they seem to have more deleterious, possibly, uh, CNVs, um, individuals with autism compared to typically developing controls. And you can see they come up with a different list of genes, um, all important brain express genes, but you know, different from the one above. So that, again, tells you about the genetic heterogeneity in this disorder. Our group here at Yale also published a genome-wide uh, CNV study and found that in simplex families, there's a higher rate of rare de novo CNV. So simplex families are those in which there's only one affected child. And the thinking is that in these families, that the uh, disorder is due to de novo mutations or spontaneous mutations instead of something being inherited from parents that would affect multiple children. And so uh, comparing um, uh, in, uh, individuals with autism with their unaffected siblings, the individuals with autism did have a higher rate of these rare de novo CNVs. And these are the regions that we found. You can see there's some overlap. We also landed on Norexin 1 just like this group, but this all usually seems to be the exception when two groups land on the same gene. So if these are all rare causes of autism, why is it important? Like, does it help us really uncover the pathophysiology of the disorder? And I would say that even though they are individually rare, they are important because they do implicate gene networks. Since we have so little understanding of where exactly maybe or when exactly in the brain the things are going awry in autism, this at least gives us some clues to try to figure out the pathophysiology of the disorder. All right, so not, one hot topic um, in the field and in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders in general is looking for overlaps um, in genetic etiology. And so we know that autism and schizophrenia are two very different disorders, but interestingly, there's some common genetics. So here, um, 
is a paper that mapped out some of the CNVs that are specifically found in autism, um, those in schizophrenia are in blue, but then there are regions throughout the genome in which there are CNVs that um, appear in both autism and schizophrenia. For example, like right here on chromosome 15 and here on chromosome 1. So why is this important? Well, this again might shed light, uh, autism and schizophrenia might shed light on each other. Why do two different disorders have some common genetic elements? Maybe there are some common pathways that are affected in both. So another um, technique that looks at um, uh, across the entire genome is whole exome sequencing. And this technique has really revolutionized our work in human genetics because it's really sped up our work. So uh, there was a time, um, like with that patient I showed you with the chromosomal abnormality in the FISH experiment where we looked at one patient at a time or one family at a time, maybe one gene at a time and try to make an association with autism, but whole exome sequencing lets us look at all the genes. And there's about 20,000 some genes in the human genome. We can look at them all at once in every individual in one experiment. You can imagine how fast um, our experiments go then. So the purpose of whole exome sequencing is to obtain the DNA sequence for the entire coding region or the exome of the genome. So remember the genome is dotted with genes but there are intergenic regions in which there are no known coding genes. So this um, represents 1% really just of the, of the human genome. So the human genome is 3 billion base pairs and this is just 1% of it. But so here is for example a section of the exome a reference sequence, and what you get from whole exome sequencing are these short reads of, of bases, and you get millions in, uh, of these reads, and you try to line them up, which is a big bioinformatics challenge, to the reference genome, and look to see where you might see a mutation. And so you try to find mutations this way, and again, the, the power of it is that you're looking at all genes at once instead of one gene at a time. So. Um, this is uh, the, kind of like a fancy glass slide with these small channels in which you um, input the patient's DNA. And um, what happens, here's a, a diagram of what's going on, the chemical reaction. The power comes in the fact that the DNA, the patient's DNA is sheared up into chunks and then um, it's basically amplified over and over again um, and that enables it to be sequenced at a great enough depth where you can find rare mutations. So you have hundreds of millions of these molecular clusters where you've amplified chunks of the patient's DNA and it's all done in this machine that really just sits on a, on a, a bench top in the lab over um, in our west campus and uh, this is called the Illumina HiSeq machine. And here was our experimental design for whole exome sequencing. We studied 200 quartets from the Simon Simplex collection. This is a collection of very rigorously phenotyped uh, families affected by autism that are all, uh, mostly simplex, meaning that there's only one affected child. Actually, they're all simplex. And um, what our hypothesis was, so when I say quartet, I mean that you have a pedigree like this, a family structure, a, a father, a mother. In this example, there are two sons, one affected by autism and one who is typically developing. And so our hypothesis is that there are more de novo variants in patients compared to their unaffected siblings, which accounts for their phenotype. So when you do whole exome sequencing, you have about a 30 million base pair target. As I said, it's about 1% of the genome. And so whole exome sequencing yields 100 million of those short reads, each about 75 base pairs long. And analysis is done on a high performance cluster, which you can imagine is a lot of processing power. Um, and so this is kind of what you get the output. So um, there are a number of steps where you get the raw reads from the West Campus, from the Yale Center for Genome Analysis, so the raw sequencing reads. And then you go through many um, uh, steps, uh, algorithms um, to align the reads to the reference genome, and then look for possible mutations, and then try to figure out which ones might be de novo, and then try to annotate the variants, meaning are the variants in a gene, are they in a brain express gene, have they changed a site that's pretty well conserved through evolution, which maybe makes it more important. So, so for in this one subject, we got almost 100 million reads, 98% of them aligned correctly to the reference genome. And so we also have a lot of other statistics involved, like mean coverage. So each base we see, see on average about 120 times. And you have to have a, a lot of depth to this because if there's a very rare variant, you might not see it very often, right? So you need a lot of depth. 
Um, the error rate is, is uh, pretty okay, 1.5%. Um, so in this one person from whole exome sequencing, we got about 30,000 different variants throughout the exome. And so that's a lot of variants to try to investigate and try to figure out which one might be associated with the phenotype of this, of this patient. So then we try to filter in various ways. For example, we might look at those variants that are novel, that no one has ever reported before, for example. Uh, we might, again, look for variants that are just brain expressed or um, are conserved positions, et cetera. So even when you do this, you still end up with a lot of variants. You have almost 800 novel variants in this one person. So again, it's a big bioinformatics challenge to do this type of analysis, but it's actually proven to be quite high yield. So here are the results of our whole exome sequencing experiment. So we found, just as we had hypothesized, that um, there are more brain-expressed protein-changing de novo mutations in patients compared to their unaffected siblings. Now, it's not that the siblings didn't have any of these. In fact, they had, we found 67 of these types of what we would think deleterious mutations um, in 200 unaffected siblings. But it happened that the patients had more, and significantly more, with an odds ratio of over two. So this tells us that these types of damaging mutations, or we think are damaging mutations, are enriched in patients with autism compared to their unaffected siblings. And remember the, the recurring theme I said of like low yield? <laughs> so after all this work, really we landed on one gene called SCN2A that was um, where, we, we, where we had a recurrent hit. In other words, we landed on this gene in more than one family. In fact, we landed on two families. So <laughs> two families, um, with each with a de novo mutation and a brain expressed um, gene in SCN2A. Um, it actually has been associated previously with epilepsy, but these patients with autism in our group didn't have epilepsy, didn't have seizures, meaning that maybe these uh, mutations are not just associated with epilepsy, but they are actually associated with autism in these families. Um, so that's what we found. But uh, there were a number of other groups who were also doing whole exome sequencing. Um, on families affected by autism. So in a total of 1,000 families, there were a handful of genes, um, one, two, three, four, five others, so half a dozen altogether, in which there was more than one um, of these uh, deleterious mutations occurring. Um, and since this is so rare, um, statistically speaking, they seem to be strongly associated with autism because they are so rare and that when we find them more than, in more than one family, we think that there's a strong association there. So again, this gene list is diverse. So as you can see throughout this whole talk so far that there is no one gene causing autism. As I mentioned before, there's not even a few, there seems to be many, and people estimate that there might be hundreds of genes involved in autism. So how do you get a handle on this? Before I get to that, I'll just mention something about CHD8, because the follow-up studies after the exome studies have shown that um, identified at least a few more, I think up to eight or nine now, de novo mutations in this one gene, which is an interesting gene because it regulates transcription. It regulates um, the expression of other genes. So sometimes you might wonder, well, how can one mutation and one gene cause a disorder as complicated as autism? Well, this gene um, is one of these master regulatory genes. It affects the expression, how other genes are turned on and off. So you can imagine that it would have diverse effects if it was mutated and, and dysfunctional or non-functional in a patient with autism. So these are, this is the human chromosome displayed in this black strand that's been packaged up by proteins called histones. And so CHD8 helps recruit um, or binds with other proteins at these uh, nucleosomes is what they're referred to as this packaged chromosomes, and they affect the, the expression or the transcription of these genes, how they're turned on and off. So, uh, so it's a very interesting candidate gene that's uh, become a, a, a um, people have become very interested in in the autism genetics field. All right, so here's a diagram that I found actually from the Emory Genetics Laboratory website, um, which really shows well the genetic architecture of autism, that there are many different genes that seem to be involved. Um, there's a chunk of uh, cases of autism which uh, seem to be due to common variants that, in other words, variants that are not so rare, that are found in at least 1% of the general population. So maybe these genes contribute a small amount of risk, but together they, they, they can create the phenotype in a person. There is also um, single gene Mendelian forms, um, especially those that I showed you overlap with genetic syndromes, for example, that are associated with autism. Cytogenetic abnormalities that have been um, reported, for example, the 15Q duplication. Um, so any, and what I'm trying to get across here is that there seems to be a lot of genes involved, many types of mutations involved, and so how do we get a handle on what the common pathway might be?
Well, it's going to be developmental neurobiology that's going to help us figure this out. So there were two really um, great studies, one coming from Yale, from Nanat Sistin's lab, in which um, the human brain transcriptome was analyzed. And so what I mean by that is that in thi this particular paper, this research group took um, just a couple of subjects, postmortem brain tissue, and looked at many, many regions, numerous regions throughout the brain, and looked to see which genes are being turned on and off and are, are being expressed um, in those brain regions. I think it was something like over a thousand different regions or spots. Um, so in other words, these groups are trying to develop an atlas of gene expression throughout the brain. So um, Dr. Seston's group here at Yale also did a similar experiment. Uh, well, they looked at many brains. They looked at a handful of regions in each one, but they also had about a thousand different samples. Um, so in their, um, this is an example of their results for a gene called neuroligin 4X, which has been associated with autism. On the y-axis is the signal intensity of how strongly that gene is expressed in various regions. This on the x-axis is the age of the postmortem brain tissue. So they span from like six weeks after uh, post-conceptual age all the way to 80-year-old brains. So they looked at the entire lifespan and found, for example, that neuroligin 4X is expressed very strongly throughout the entire lifespan. This is considered strong expression. So when you have a map like this, then what you can do is you can take your list of what you think are very important genes in autism that have seemed to have a lot of evidence for association and see and try to map out when are they turned on and off in the brain throughout the entire lifespan. And this is a review from Matt State and Nanad Zestin looking at some of these strongly associated genes, um, genes strongly associated with autism and looking to see, okay, you know, what is their level of expression um, shown on the y-axis across the lifetime. And some of these seem to travel together. So when you have genes that are co-expressed, meaning they're turned on or off at the same time in certain regions of the brain, you think, well, maybe they function together in some common pathway, and that gives us clues as to the, what the pathophysiology is of the disorder. So here's a very simplified diagram of a nerve cell some of these genes, like CHD8 that I mentioned before, are uh, functioning in the uh, central part of the body of the neuron. Some are out here in the neural synapse. So here's, a, again, a simplified diagram of a synapse and showing that a bunch of these genes that have been associated with autism function at the synapse, which is the fundamental functional unit of the, of the nervous system. So it makes sense that there it would be a site of dysfunction, right, in autism. So you're going from you know, a long list of diverse genes to figuring out, okay, where are they being expressed and how could they be causing the disorder? And expression studies like this really help us in that way. Here um, is a diagram um, for a gene co-expression analysis, again done in, in Matt's lab here at Yale, where um, uh, Jeremy Wilsey took a bunch of autism associated genes from the exome studies and then also took this uh, transcriptome analysis done by uh, Nanat Sestin's lab and do something called a co-expression network analysis. So look to see, um, are these genes, again, correlated in terms of their expression? Um, are they being turned on and off at the same times in the same regions? So building this kind of co-expression network where these uh, C genes are autism-associated genes and looking to see what's co-expressed with them, try to implicate other genes um, in autism. And so amazingly, um, this diverse gene list actually converges in certain specific parts of the brain and in specific time periods, which tells us, okay, well, this is maybe when and where things go awry in causing autism. So it turns out that these genes converge in mid-fetal development um, and that it's in the prefrontal and primary motor somatosensory cortex. And not only that, but specifically in layer five and six of the uh, cortex in glutamatergic projection neurons. So here, this is really a great study that went from a bunch of genes to like when and where in the brain this, uh, might, these genes might be acting and um, where mutations in these genes might be having an effect. Okay, so I've been talking about whole exome sequencing that is really you know, as I said, revolutionized, accelerated our work, but whole genome sequencing is definitely here. Um, it's still about three to four times more expensive than whole exome sequencing, but the price gets cheaper every day. And so there will come a point where instead of just looking at the exome, the protein coding region um, in each patient, we can look at the entire genome. And we know from recent um, ENCODE studies that about something like 80% of intergenic regions are also transcribed. They might not be genes, but there are RNAs of various sorts that have various functions.
Um, so this is a picture of the ion proton um, whole genome sequencing machine that also sits right on a bench top. I think there's one of these in our West Campus as well that is being piloted. And so this is the fancy looking glass slide in which you input in the patient's DNA and then the entire genome um, is sequenced. And so again, imagine the big bioinformatics um, a challenge that is it's 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 challenging enough to look at the exome but the whole genome now you have 100 times as much information I like showing this slide. This is the cost per human genome through years. So way back in 2001, it cost $100 million to sequence, um, to do genome sequencing in one person. This was the Human Genome Project, and it took how many years? Over 10 years? Something like that. And then um, if you compare the cost per human genome over the years, you see how much it's dropped. So this is Moore's Law, which you might be familiar with. It, it, um, talks about uh, computer, you know, computing power doubling about every 18 months or two years. And so any technology that's beating Moore's law is really advancing quite rapidly. So the human genome now, well, at least in 2012, was less than $10,000 per human genome. So you can see how dropped the, uh, steep that decline has been. And I've heard of genomes as, as um, little as $3,000 now to get an entire genome sequenced in a person. So, and actually there are a few studies now that have looked at whole genome sequencing in autism. Um, so looking at all the bases, not just the exome. So one group a couple of years ago looked at um, 10 concordant monozygotic twins and their parents, and their conclusion was that there are some hot spots for de novo mutations um, in autism. Another group looked at 32 families, found de novo mutations in about 20% of them, inherited mutations um, in about a third of them, and also came up with a candidate gene list, some of which you might be familiar with, like the Norexin one, you saw that before, SCN2A we found with the exome sequencing. So now we're beginning to land on the same gene more than once in some of these studies, um, and then found some novel genes as well. Another group looked at 10 members of just one family, including two affected um, individuals, and found that the two affected uh, probands um, shared mutations in a gene called ANC3. Uh, so that was also interesting. So you'll see more and more of these whole genome sequencing studies as, as time goes on. All right, so just to switch gears a little bit from the uh, research field to clinical genetics evaluation, because a common question I get from clinicians is, all right, so I have a family affected by autism, I have a, a child, um, how do I evaluate them in terms of genetics? And this is a, a hot topic, like what are the appropriate tests to do? Um, so it's clear though that clinical genetics evaluation will become increasingly routine in the medical assessment of autism. And so uh, another thing that uh, clinicians often ask is, well, should I only get clinical genetics testing done in kids who are severely affected because I'm more likely to find something? And so one group a while back now tried to address this question by looking at kids with classical autism versus a milder form of autism, PDD-NOS. Back, in, back then, and then found about similar rates. Even though it was a small study, the point here was that everyone on the spectrum deserves clinical genetic testing, not those who are just the most severely affected. So the American College of Medical Genetics has put out some practice parameters for how this uh, genetics evaluation should look. Um, Needless to say, there should be a, a well-documented family history pedigree analysis, at least of three generations, because that can help you look to see, is there something being inherited, being passed down in an autosomal dominant fashion or recessive fashion, or maybe in an X-linked fashion. Um, it's important to identify known syndromes, like fragile X or tuberous sclerosis or others, because um, some of these other genetic syndromes uh, can have other organ involvement, so you don't want to miss that. So examination with special attention to dysmorphisms, because these genetic syndromes are often have uh, very specific dysmorphisms associated with them. If the specific syndrome is suspected, then to do targeted testing for that particular syndrome, like Angelman syndrome, for example, there is testing for that. Um, and then if clinical indicators are present, then you do metabolic or mitochondrial testing as well. Um, so uh, another recommendation from the group is to do chromosomal microarray analysis or CMA analysis. This is um, basically looking for copy number variants, CNVs, for duplications or deletions across the genome. And then also testing for fragile X because there is a significant overlap between fragile X and autism routinely in males um, in this X-linked disorder. And then in females if indicators are present, so example, if there's positive family history or, uh, or phenotypes. <clears throat> 
So um, this group um, in their paper projected some diagnostic yields for various clinical genetics experiments, uh, excuse me, evaluations, and found that for chromosomal microarrays, again, looking for CNVs, that about 10% of the time they're positive. And so this is important to know. Um, again, it might not help exactly that particular individual in terms of their treatment, but it might be very important for genetic counseling purposes if those parents are thinking about having other children or if there are uncles and aunts who are worried about their own children, you know, having, is there something being passed around in a family. Um, for fragile X testing, is about one to five percent of the time it's positive. MECP2 is a gene associated with Rett syndrome, but also cases of autism. So f about four percent of females turn out to be positive for mutations in this gene. P10 is involved in overgrowth syndromes, uh, this gene, and five percent of the time it appears to be mutated, especially in those kids that have a head circumference that's, that's large. Um, karyotypes, so looking for chromosomal abnormalities, um, and a karyotype is three 3% of the time, and that's positive. So this group estimates um, that you can identify some type of genetic abnormality etiology in about 30 to 40% of individuals, and so strongly recommends that all of these uh, individuals get some type of clinical, or should get thorough clinical genetics evaluation. Here is an example um, I found on the web of a commercial autism gene panel. These have become um, very popular. Uh, so this is just one example. I've, there are many examples on the web. And so what these companies are, are um, advertising are these autism gene panels, so testing for a bunch of genes that have been associated with autism. And often they're directed to parents who already have a child with autism and they're worried about a younger child. So I just want to, I think our goal in the future um, we hope as human geneticists that we will have such an autism gene panel that will accurately predict risk um, for autism in an individual who is not yet has been diagnosed. But we just have to be very cautious because these lists of genes, some of them have weak association with autism or some of them are very rare causes of autism. So even if you, if you have a child with a mutation in one of these genes in one of these commercial autism gene panels, it's not always easy to interpret what that mutation might mean. So we just have to proceed cautiously um, with these commercial gene panels. All right, so another very important question I get from um, especially parents is asking, well, wh why, you know, how does it help my child to figure out what gene might be involved? Um, is it going to change management? Is it going to change treatment? Um, is it worth uh, spending all these resources um, and trying to find the genes for autism. And I, I would argue that, yes, it is really important. I'm a bit biased, obviously, but I'm going to give you some examples of why it's so important to find the genetic etiology of a disorder. So genes can really help us understand the pathophysiology, the disease mechanism, and that can really help us try to design um, uh, treatments. So here's one example, Rett syndrome, which is caused by, most cases are caused by mutations in a specific gene called MECP2. So mutations in MECP2 cause about 98% of cases. It controls the expression of other genes. So it's like that CHD8 where it, ex it, 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 um, it regulates the, the expression of a lot of other genes. So patients with Rett syndrome show abnormal neurons, but not neuronal death. So the big question here is, can viable but defective neurons be repaired? So a research group developed a mutant mice um, mouse model lacking the MECP2 gene, and these mice developed neurological symptoms reminiscent of what you find um, in patients with uh, Rett syndrome. What they did next was they genetically reactivated the MECP2 gene, and they did this in adult mutant mice. So not in pups, not in utero, but in adult mice, and they were able to reverse some symptoms, including deficits in neuronal signaling in the hippocampus, which has been associated with autism. So the big takeaway here is that absence of this gene doesn't irreversibly damage neurons, and that you can do some um, reversal of symptoms even in adult mice. So the thinking always is, well, is there any hope after a child is born and is you know, can we intervene in any way? And so obviously this is many steps removed from, you know, human treatment. But the point here, the, the, what they were trying to show is that even in adult mice, that they were able to reverse some symptoms. Um, and that uh, um, there's a lot more plasticity in the brain than we, than we suspect, even in later ages. Here's another example, fragile X syndrome and fMR1. So I mentioned before, I believe that loss of fMR1 causes fragile X. It also controls the expression of other genes like MECP2. The pathophysiology of this disorder involves hyperactivity of the glutamate receptor, mGluR5, in the brain. So a research group 
uh, created mutant mice that lacked the gene and they developed neurological symptoms just like the human patients. And they found that by reducing expression of this hyperactive glutamate receptor, by just half, they were able to show rescue of symptoms, including alterations in dendritic density um, on neural cells and hippocampal protein synthesis. So, um, and they've, uh, another group found that the GABA agonist R baclofen, um, which is a pharmaceutical agent, um, corrects increased synaptic protein synthesis and spine density in these uh, mutant, uh, oh no, actually, in, yeah, in mutant mice, I believe. Um, so again, we, we have gone from um, mutations in a very specific gene called fMR1 to trying to, to some insights into the pathophysiology of Fragile X and then to developing uh, treatments. And here's my last example of tuberous sclerosis and TSC. So mutations in the TSC1 and TSC2 genes cause tuberous sclerosis. The pathophysiology of this disorder involves um, a signaling pathway in the hippocampus called mTOR pathway or mammalian target of rapamycin uh, pathway. So mutant mice lacking one copy of TSC2 show cognitive deficits and treating again adult mice um, with rapamycin improves synaptic plasticity and behavioral deficits. Another group looked at mutant mice lacking one or two copies of TSC1 in the cerebellum. Um, these mice show decreased neuronal activity, abnormal social interaction and repetitive behavior and then treating with rapamycin. So targeting this uh, signaling pathway prevented pathological and behavioral uh, deficits. So again, an, a great example of going from genes to pathophysiology to, um, to a very specific treatments. All right, so here are some future directions for the field. Um, I think uh, most people would agree in our field that it's very important to increase our study population. So most of the studies that I was talking to you about had at the most about 1,000 families, 1,500 families, which sounds like a lot, but if you look at other complex disorders like, for example, blood pressure studies, um, heart disease studies, those, those uh, studies include tens of thousands of patients. And maybe we haven't come up with the entire genetic etiology of autism yet, haven't figured it out because we just don't, are not looking at enough patients in each one of these studies. So I think that's very important that we increase study populations by tenfold at least. And then I mentioned whole genome sequencing. So it's important to look at the protein coding regions, but it really is also important to look at regulatory elements, those intergenic regions, promoters, um, other areas that are involved in gene expression. Um, looking at mitochondrial sequences um, because there might be associations between metabolic and mitochondrial defects in autism. Doing pathway analysis. So this is talks to, uh, this uh, speaks to um, having a diverse uh, list of genes and then trying to figure out are there some common pathways where they converge um, to produce the phenotype. I didn't mention much about epigenetics, but so epigenetics is the chemical modification of the DNA sequence. So these are, um, uh, might also be associated with disorders like autism. But the challenge with epigenetics is that it's very tissue specific and it's hard for us to go around getting brain biopsies from our patients. But it's a field that we will have to try to you know, address and some people have been trying to address in autism. Um, looking at biomarkers is a very hot topic. So taking results from neuroimaging studies, eye tracking experiments, um, ERPs, and these are all being done here at Yale, which is why it makes it a great and rich area for research at, at Yale on autism. And looking to see, well, if we can stratify our, our patients with some of these more quantitative um, uh, markers, then maybe we can find a, a common genetic mechanism in those patients. Looking for the genetic overlap between neuropsychiatric disorders, I showed one quick example of schizophrenia and autism and how they might shed light on each other. And then really what's so important is doing a functional analysis um, of variants. So this means bridging the genetics and the neuroscience. So, so we might have a list of genes, might have a list of mutations that seem to be strongly associated with autism, but we really need to do the follow-up work. So looking to see, well, are these particular mutations really causing damage to the structure and function of a protein? So doing in vitro and in vivo studies, for example, in cell culture, um, in mice, um, doing post-mortem brain tissue work. A really hot topic in our field is something called induced pluripotent stem cells. So as I mentioned, it's not possible to go around getting brain biopsies from our patients and we've been limited to looking at, for example, blood cells because they're easy to obtain, relatively easy to obtain from our families and looking to see, well, you know, is there anything wrong with gene expression in blood cells, for example? And that's not a, the best proxy, right, for the brain. So um, this technique involves taking blood cells, reprogramming them into immature, into uh, pluripotent stem cells, and then 
reprogramming them into neural cells. So now you have this in a dish where it might not be cells, neural cells from the brain of a patient, but you've taken their blood cells and kind of transformed them into neurons. And then you can study the neurons and see what's going on. Is there anything going awry in the neurons? So I have a couple of slides showing how there are different types of stem cells, including embryonic stem cells um, and these iPSC cells, which involve taking body cells like uh, fibroblasts or blood cells and reprogramming them with chemicals to turn them into an immature state. And then um, there are uh, naturally occurring stem cells in the body from various organs. But the point is that these kinds of uh, uh, stem cells can be transformed into any type of tissue. Um, and so our uh, interest would be taking these iPSC-induced pluripotent stem cells and transferring them into neural cells and looking to see what's wrong maybe perhaps with these neural cells. So we can create stem cell models of autism. Um, so taking these iPSC cells, turning them into neurons, and just looking again in a dish, kind of an in vitro disease model. And then maybe someday, even down the road, we can do drug and uh, screening, maybe toxicology testing and, and drug development. That's you know, a bit far off, but that's the hope um, by going this route. So that's a really um, a, a hot topic in the field. Uh, the next step after finding genes and mutations is to really study those mutations in depth and see uh, how they might be uh, bringing about autism. Great, so um, thank you for your attention and uh, I'll take any questions.